Joey, thank you for coming on the podcast, my man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me, dude. Been looking forward to this for a while. I knew it would happen one of these days. Yeah. And so I'd love to start with Interstellar. It's your favorite movie or one of your favorite movies ever. And I was curious why you're so fascinated by Interstellar. It's a great question. And man, you you do pay attention. So Interstellar is by far my favorite movie. And this, this is going to be a long-winded answer. So back before I really got into psychology and programming, I was really into space. In fact, there's a faded NASA sticker on my old car that, <clears throat> you know, I, I got that when I started college because I actually intended to wind up working at NASA. So my life dream at the time was to design hardware for probes that would go way out into space. So, you know, as things do, the dream changed over time. And now I'm finally getting to live my current dream. But I'm, I still have a huge interest in space. So back in 2014, when I went to go see Interstellar, I was absolutely blown away. And I, it caught me by surprise because when I saw that uh, Matt McConaughey was the main star, you know, he's largely a comedic actor. So I wasn't expecting him to do that well. But it's an absolutely incredible experience. I, I have a huge thing for black holes. Black holes are absolutely fascinating to me and terrifying. And I loved how much actual science went into the movie. So for those who don't know, Chris Nolan, the director, worked with Kip Thorne, a theoretical physicist, and they did, or Thorne did, a massive amount of calculations and theories about black holes and time travel and all that stuff, and or time dilation specifically. And I just, I, I love how much actual effort went into that. It's one of the most scientifically sound and accurate space movies ever made. So I loved all that. And now anytime that I get to show Interstellar to my offline friends, it's, they're blown away by it because it's, it really is an experience. It transcends being a film. It, it's just an incredible two and a half hour experience. For those who haven't seen it, I cannot recommend it enough. The soundtrack's incredible as well because of the legendary Hans Zimmer. And in fact, the Interstellar soundtrack is one of my favorite things to listen to when I'm in focus mode. Mm. And I'm sure we'll get into more tips on focus mode later on. But you mentioned black holes. What, what about black holes fascinate you so much? The mystery around them. The fact that it's, <clears throat> you know, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to ever find out what's inside of a black hole because nothing can escape its gravitational pull, right? So light can't even escape the event horizon of a black hole. So it's not like somebody could just pop in there and pop back out. You know, whatever's, whatever gets sucked into a black hole goes somewhere. But there is a theory that the singularity inside of a black hole could be a wormhole. So maybe somebody would come out on the other side. But then they would need some way to communicate that if they survive. <clears throat> so it's something that we'll get to ex experiment with one day. But if you're not there yet, um, they're also... It's incredibly terrifying because they're just masses of blackness. You know, it, it's, I was just funny. I was just talking about some to someone about that a couple hours ago about how, like, every time I watch a video about black holes, it's just kind of unnerving seeing this huge thing. And like, as the video approaches a black hole, you know, you see the lensing effects and the, the thing just covers up all of your vision. And it's just, they're, they're just incredible to me. How do you not get overwhelmed by the enormity of the universe and space? It, it, is it freeing for you? Yeah, definitely. So there's actually been a, a meme floating around our side of Twitter lately where, you know, there's two different approaches that we could take. You know, we could look up at the night sky and read about this stuff and think, man, I'm really insignificant and I don't matter in the grand scheme of the universe. Or you could be excited and think that, man, it's really cool that I'm here and I get to appreciate all the beauty in the universe. And it's so interesting thinking about things like the pillars of creation, if you've seen that incredible image of that nebula, and thinking about how that probably doesn't even exist anymore because it took the light so long to travel over to the telescope that picked up that image that has probably been blown away by a, a storm 
And so it may not even exist anymore. So thinking about how there's all these things incredibly far away from us is exciting, but it does make me sad that my generation probably won't get to explore much of it. But I'm hopeful that we can start working together a little bit better and explore the universe a little more while I'm still here. Yeah, it must be how people from the 1400s or 1500s felt like about the entire understanding the the earth and yeah. saying to themselves, wow, like my generation probably won't get to experience the other parts of the world, but I, I, I can't imagine what it might be like. And I think something similar is going to happen in the next 500 years for the human race of, of colonizing galaxies and or at least our own galaxy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you think, I was reading last night when I was procrastinating about something, I was reading about Tombstone, Arizona, because another one of my favorite movies is Tombstone. And I was reading about, you know, all these characters, Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday and whatnot. And I was looking at when Wyatt Earp died. He died in 1920-something. So this legendary cowboy lawman was around 100 years ago less than 100 years ago, right? 200 years ago, 230-ish years ago, our country was founded. The United States was founded. And it's just crazy, like, how much things have changed in the span of decades or even a couple centuries. So if you think about, I mean, things have changed a lot in my lifetime. I was born in 1990, so I just turned 31. And it's incredible seeing how much things have changed, largely driven by social media. And it's going to be interesting seeing how much things change throughout the rest of my lifetime and then thinking about, you know, even beyond then. So that actually is a big part of why I do what I do now. It may not be related to space, but a big part of why I do what I do today is to basically leave a positive legacy. And I know that gets thrown around a lot. It's kind of cheesy and cliche, but my goal is basically to leave the world a better place than it was when I came into it. Right. So I want to leave a positive legacy. And now that I'm working with people one on one, I'm essentially trying to create multipliers. You know, if I make someone a business owner better, then they're going to make things better for their clients and it creates a multiplying effect. So it's just, I may not be around to see the best of humanity in the future, but at least I can help us get there. So going to space, how did you go from space to then working as an engineer to now doing what you're doing now? Take us through that progression. Sure. So when I first started college back in 2012, I started as a business major because I wanted to be a hospital manager. My mom's a nurse. I wanted to be a hospital manager because I knew they made a lot of money, <clears throat> but I realized that money wasn't everything and the MBAs were getting kind of oversaturated at the time. So about six weeks into my first ever semester, I switched to computer engineering because I was like, well, I'm a huge nerd. Like I love video games. <clears throat> I love music production. I love space and things like that. So I'll become an engineer. And so I started studying computer science and eventually computer engineering. But there's a little difference between those two. But yeah, so I first targeted NASA and then it kind of changed over time. I realized that I didn't want to move that far away from my family because she, they're up in Tennessee. My mom's up in Tennessee. I didn't want to move that far away from them. And also that NASA doesn't really pay people much. A lot of government agencies don't seem to nowadays, but NASA especially because they don't really have to because a lot of people want to go work at NASA when they grow up. <laughs> so um, I decided to try different things. I really liked robotics programming when I was in, at Georgia Tech. I enjoyed that, but I got kind of sick of the hardware aspect of it. And then in my final semester, I just turned down a job offer to go work in Nashville, Tennessee for a defense contractor because I don't like Nashville. And <clears throat> I really wanted to stay here in Atlanta. So I went into panic mode and started studying web development. And because I you know, would go on LinkedIn and see all these job offers or job postings for web dev stuff, so I started studying that, not really being passionate about it. And then I wound up getting a job in the industry in January, 2019, that I'm about to leave. So that's exciting. But yeah, so I got into the industry and realized 
this really isn't for me. I don't like the corporate environment. You know, it's so much process. It's just very soul crushing. It's the best way to des describe it. It takes all the fun out of development and programming. And so that's where the project of Improvement Geek was born. So in summer 2018, going backwards a little bit, I started studying psychology or I started studying self-help stuff to help me improve myself. I have been on a weight loss journey roller coaster for several years and I needed something to help get me over that little hump. So I started reading self-help books just kind of on a whim. Got addicted to them as a lot of people do, but I got really tired of the cliches and the, the bad advice. So being a nerd, I started studying psychology and neuroscience to actually understand how my brain worked. So then I kept doing that over the next year or so. Fast forward to, you know, a couple months into 2019 into my new job that I hated almost immediately. It suddenly hit me that I could start using the knowledge that I learned to help other people. And so I thought about it and then I created a YouTube channel under the name Improvement Geek. And that was an homage to two of my biggest influences at the time, Improvement Pill and Thomas Frank, aka College Info Geek. And they're still two of my favorite people. And so, yeah, I started creating YouTube videos. At the time, I wasn't very good at communicating and I really overthought the videos. So they just came across as basically like science lectures and that's not really fun for YouTube. So, you know, I did that for a long time. And then in January, 2020, I took a break from YouTube, got on Twitter with like 200 followers with my personal account, switched that to a brand account. And then a year and a half later, I am somehow where I am. You know, I really attribute that to focusing on growing my network, communicating, not taking myself quite as seriously as I used to. And yeah, I mean, I'm happy to answer more questions about that if you want. I've been talking for like five minutes now. <laughs> You're good, man. <laughs> I want to go to Thomas Frank and Improvement Pill. Yeah. What, what specifically attracted you to their content? So Thomas Frank is, seems like an incredible dude. He's like, he makes his videos fun. Uh, he's definitely a nerd. Like you can tell like by his background, you know, he has the Castlevania poster and everything, but I love his production quality and his presentation. I love how, how good his work ethic is. A lot of his videos ha have had a big influence on my life. So that, 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 yeah, he, he's an awesome dude. And then improvement pill, you know, his videos are kind of like cartoony sort of like he doesn't show his face but his videos are just packed with knowledge you know like he gets the, through stuff he explains stuff like so quickly and so concise so those are the reasons why those are the two big you know productivity self-improvement rather uh youtubers that i got into there are other good ones you know better ideas i forget his real name but joe i think but better ideas is another good one can you take us to a piece of content that you actually remember as like transforming your life and why specifically it transformed your life yeah, so there was a video by Thomas Frank about five things that are killing your productivity. And I watched that video and I was like, man, like I'm doing almost all these. <laughs> and some stuff that was in there was, you know, perfectionism. I've always been somebody who shoots for perfection. You know, I've, I've, even before I started college, I had kind of an engineering mindset where I would get hung up on like the little details of how something worked and I would try to polish something and make it work the best that it could. And that costs a ton of time, you know, and then stuff like having too much process and, you know, not keeping track of your systems, maybe not even having systems, but a too much or too little process can also be a big killer. So I realized that I was doing a lot of those things and it helped me really back before I knew what self-improvement was that helped me improve my productivity while I was in college. Mm. Before you're also talking about your weight loss journey and yep. transformation, I assume that's how you use a lot of these YouTube videos, or at least this knowledge that you're gaining. What about that journey do you now take forward with you to your present day? The biggest thing is persistence. So I've lost over 170 pounds. So you know, literally became half the man I used to be. And the biggest <laughs> thing that I learned from that was persistence and not 
letting myself get sidetracked when things aren't going well. So when you're losing that much weight, you're going to have bad days. You're going to hit plateaus. You're going to have cheat days or cheat weeks. In my case, I would usually gain 10, 15 pounds every final season. Also, like I, I don't do well when it's gray and cloudy out. And even here in Georgia during the winter, even, some of the fall, even it gets pretty like gray and cloudy every day. And that really gets at me. So yeah, the biggest thing that I took away from that was persistence and still being consistent about the little things, even if I am not seeing results. And that is, that's where a lot of New Year's resolutioners who want to lose weight get tripped up is because they start making good decisions, but then they don't immediately see results. So they get discouraged and that's perfectly na a natural human thing to do, but they get discouraged and they think that, oh, this doesn't work or there's something wrong with me. And then they quit. Funnily enough, weight loss was the first ever kind of coaching that I did. So back in 2018, before I even started Improvement Geek or Cypreneur, I coached one of my friends and helped him lose over 100 pounds. To this day, he tells me to this day, he has still not drank Dr. Pepper or sweet tea, which he used to drink like constantly every single day. So, you know, he's at the point where he only drinks water, which is absolutely incredible. So what do you tell him to get him started on that journey? We started with a simple enough plan to get him taking action, right? So a big mistake that a lot of people make is they get overwhelmed by all the things they could do or they overwhelm themselves by creating like this big convoluted plan. And then when they actually try to get moving, you know, there's just too much, right? So we started with simple things. We started with, okay, you know, for the first week or so, just write down the stuff that you eat. Like, don't even try to change it. Just be mind, start being more mindful about the things that you're eating. And then, okay, every now and then, you know, when you go out to eat, you used to eat fast food for three meals a day. Every now and then, you know, switch out your sweet tea or your Dr. Pepper with some water and start incrementally making these changes. And then over time, like a month or two later, he was like, holy crap, like I've lost like 10 pounds. And then once you start seeing that progress, you start liking what you see in the mirror a little bit better. You start getting compliments. Your clothes start fitting better. My mom's on the same journey right now. And she's had to buy new scrubs because her old ones don't fit anymore. And she's about to move. So she's about to take a lot of her clothes to Goodwill. I'm actually going up there uh, tonight to help her move tomorrow. She's going to have to give a lot of her clothes away to, to Goodwill because they don't fit anymore. And wow. then once you start having these wins, it, it, you start building momentum. And that momentum helps you build up that persistence that I was talking about. So even when life happens, you have a bad day, have a bad week, it happens. You, you still have some of that momentum so you can easily get back on track. But the key is to start small and build up that momentum over time. With your mom, was it, did she see all the success you had? Was it you telling her, hey, Ma, I really want you to improve this. How did she take that step? So it's something that she had been wanting to do. She's been overweight for pretty much all of her life. And it's something that she's wanted to do. But, you know, she's tried things, but also she's getting a little bit older. So she ha started having some limiting beliefs about, you know, well, I, I can't do this. Like, it's harder for women. It's harder for older people. And it's harder for these hormonal reasons and stuff like that. And I, I started working with her on those first because before I would try to get her tracking food on my fitness pal and doing these other things. And it just wouldn't really work because we weren't actually getting at the core blocker, you know, the first level issue, the first level challenge. I try not to use the word problem too much, but you know, when we first started working on the initial challenge and improving her mindset and her beliefs about this stuff. And then from there, we were able to do the same thing. Start writing down what you eat and start drinking more water, less Diet Coke. And then she actually is now doing low carb, which, you know, there's, there's a big debate about which diet is best, whatever. I'm not going to get into that, but she stuck with it for months, right? And when you're doing low carb, you're cutting out a lot of sugar and other stuff. So yeah, it's been really good for her, but she has been consistent about it 
right? So like, even if I go visit her and we have a burger or something with the bun and some fries, she gets right back on it the next day. And that's really the key is saying, okay, I am intentionally or unintentionally, like I went off course today, but I'm going to get back on it tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. I'll go right back on it tomorrow. I'm not going to let this spiral off into a missed month or a missed year. And I, I have one of those where I just like didn't care for a year. So how do you get back on track so easily? Because I think that's a place where a lot of people struggle. It's like they have a cheat meal and then they're like, oh, I'm screwed. How do you convey that to someone or what thought processes are going into your mind when you are telling yourself, oh, it's just okay that I made a mistake here. I, I missed a workout, but I can just get back on track and it's all good. The key is to have systems and routines that you have been doing for a while, you know, a few weeks, a few months, the, the longer, the better. Because if you have these routines etched into your brain, then your brain will actually just want to go back to it. You know, it, it, it'll become a habit, essentially. So it will feel uncomfortable to make that first misstep. But then it'll continue to feel uncomfortable for a while if you try to keep making them. Your brain will want to pull you back on course. The brain wants to stay on course, whether that's a bad course or a good course. You know, that's just how habits work. The brain's very resistant to changes. So it'll, to answer your question, it'll largely be unconscious energy, if you will, an unconscious pull getting you back on course the next day when you get up. The problem is that it can be easy depending on what's going on in your life you know if you had a, a death in the family or something like that or you're taking finals it can be easy for that one day to turn into a lot more days and unfortunately what happens there is then you're creating a new routine in your brain so there there was a, a semester where i had done really well with weight loss i went home for a weekend and i just like hit a wall and my classes got really tough after that, or that's my excuse at least. But things got difficult, and all of a sudden, I was finding myself studying at fast food places. So, yeah. Uh, and it was just like my weight went down and then up that semester. So the key is to have the systems and tell yourself, okay, I'm going to get back on my systems tomorrow. Hmm. So what do you do when you went back to then eating fast food after making all that progress, what was the step that got you to change back into a new and improved Joey? Taking the time when I found the time, but taking the time to kind of reset and come up with a different plan, you know, like ma actually making it something of an event, you know, like putting it on my calendar, like, getting away from all my distractions. My thing, whenever I have something like that happen is I'll go to the park, take my notebooks and maybe my, probably not my laptop, but just, uh, you know, leave the devices behind, like take some blank printer paper is what I love and a pencil and just go out to the park and create a plan, you know, like brain dump about everything, create a plan from there, create a strategy to get me back on course and then do my best to, make that system a routine so that next time I go through a stressful period, the hope is that I won't fall off quite as hard as I did the time before. You mentioned brain dumps. And I think that's such an underrated tactic and strategy for becoming aware of your thoughts. And you've said that it's, it's been helpful for your clients as well. Why do you think brain dumps are so effective? And if you could define it for people who aren't familiar, that'd be great as well. Yeah, totally. So brain dumping is a form of journaling. It's not Dear Diary style journaling. It's just you take a blank piece of paper and a pen, take a couple of minutes and you write down literally anything on your mind. So it could be positive, negative, neutral, stuff about your business, work, school, family, your cat, like whatever. Just write it all down. It sounds silly, but seriously, write it all down. And what that will do is it will clear out the noise in your head. And so many of the people that I've talked to and worked with have just absolute chaos in their minds, right? Because there's so much that 
people have to deal with, especially now in our social media connected world, there's so much stuff on our, on, on our minds and we're constantly overwhelmed. So even when we're trying to focus on something, we still have a lot on our minds and it distracts us. It takes up mental resources. So what brain dumping does is it allows you to start getting that stuff out of your head. So you'll find that your mind's much more clear after doing that. And it'll also let you start organizing that stuff. So you can put things into different buckets and then you can look at, okay, here's a couple of priorities that I need to handle. Like these are pretty urgent to do in the next week or so. Then you can take those and put them on your calendar. That's the three-step process that I've had my clients go through. I actually had a call with a client this morning who has been trying that for the first time. And it's just like, it's magic to some people, you know, because a lot of people don't even really have any kind of productivity system. So you go from your entire day, you wake up and your head's chaotic and you feel like you're constantly off balance and behind the entire day. You're exhausted. You can't focus on anything. Then when you finally lay down to go to bed, you still have a lot on your mind. Maybe you'll wake up like this one guy was waking up in the middle of the night because he's like, oh, my God, I have so much to do. And then that's the cycle like day after day, month after month. It's like, even if you're getting, even if you're progressing in your business or whatever it is that you're doing, you still feel like you're failing because you, you are never satisfied. You never feel productive. You never feel focused. And so what this brain dump exercise does is it lets you basically reset, you know, it basically lets you help. It basically helps you process all this stuff that's on your mind. And that's when you can truly start organizing everything and focusing on one thing at a time and focusing on one thing at a time is how you eventually achieve great things and how you have a satisfying life where you have your focused work hours and you also have your chill relaxing hours on that topic you have this line in your bio of your twitter profile that says normalize four hour work days so yeah. fascinating what does that mean exactly so the normalized work, four hour work days is a concept that my partner Danco and I have brainstormed. And the concept there is that ideally you'll be getting the bulk of your focused work done in four hours a day. You can do a lot in four hours of focused work. If you can actually get the flow state, which for those who don't know, flow state is when you're playing a video game or playing sports and time just melts away, that's flow state. It's peak focus. You can get a lot done in four hours, right? So what Dan and I want to do is help people normalize having four hours of focused work a day and you'll get an incredible amount of work done. And I know people are going to be like, well, you know, I got to have meetings and I got to do other stuff it's like, yeah, but that's not maximal focus type stuff. It's not all that. It's not as demanding, you know, do your hard stuff in four hours and then you can do other stuff if you want to. But if you are feeling like, you know, I have, I have to work 12 hours a day, every single day, something's got to change there. You know, obviously something can be optimized. What for you personally are the non-negotiables that you have to hit on a day-to-day -day basis? I know daily walks is something that you've done every day for the past 300 something days, yep. but are there any other things that you have to do every single day? Yeah, definitely. So the very first non-negotiable is making my bed. And that's something that I have my clients do as part of their morning routine. It sounds silly. There's a, a video about the power of it by the Navy Admiral William H. McRaven. It was a com commencement speech and he wrote a short book about it. But the concept of making your bed is basically, it's the fir first decision that you make after you get out of bed in the morning. And people may say, well, I live alone. Like, who cares? Like, why does it matter? It's exactly why you should do it. Because if you are letting little things like that slip, that, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Nobody will really care that's going to bleed over into other things. And then the reverse is true as well. So when you start taking a couple extra seconds to do those little things, then that will bleed over into the rest of your life. You'll start keeping your home cleaner. You'll start making things a little bit better for your clients or 
you know, whatever job you're doing. And that just grows from there. Another thing that is non-negotiable for me is brain dumping. So I do brain dumping every day because it helps clear my mind. And then I follow that up with meditation. So brain dumping and meditation are a good one-two punch for either the morning or the evening. It's up to you. You know, different people like doing it at different times. But those two are really good to do back to back because brain dumping helps clear your mind. And the clearer your mind is when you're trying to meditate, the better because it'll be more effective. And then that can either set you up for a productive day in the morning, or it can help you calm down and relax so you can sleep better. Did you ever imagine when you were growing up homeschooled that you would one day be helping people with their productivity, helping people pursue the highest versions of themselves. Did that ever cross your mind in any capacity? Did I'm actually glad you asked me that because nobody has ever asked me that before. No, not at all. My world was so small when I was growing up. So for those who don't know my story, I was unofficially homeschooled when I was growing up and people nine times out of 10 are like, what do you mean unofficially? <laughs> I didn't go to school. I didn't, I was not in a homeschooling program. I did nothing. I sat in my room and I read, I listened to music. I would watch Bill Nye, the science guy and speed racer and WWF. And, you know, that was all I did with my life until, um, I was 16. My dad passed away when I was 16. And then my mom, you know, my, my life story is a, a little bit longer than that. But so my mom, you know, we moved, she got her nursing license back and then I got addicted to world of Warcraft. So I still didn't do anything with my life. I was playing world of Warcraft for like 12 to 16 hours a day. I got up to over 370 pounds. I was pre-diabetic. I had real extremely low testosterone, all that good stuff. And so I feel like life didn't really begin for me until tw I was 22 and I started college and I, I didn't have any ambition at all when I was like, before then. I didn't think about any of that stuff. All I cared about when I was a kid, like a young teenager was reading. You know, I love the Animorphs series and Harry Potter and stuff like that. I just consumed books. And then past that, you know, from 16 to about 21, I just played World of Warcraft. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any ambitions, didn't have a job. I had a cat, you know, that's about it. But it wasn't until I turned 22 and started college that I really started thinking about like, okay, what do I want to do with my life? And then I felt like that kept changing. I would experiment with different things or I get distracted by a shiny object and I would, you know, go down a different path until I came up with the concept of improvement geek, which is now Cypreneur. Like I found what I feel called to do. You know, like that is the most rewarding feeling to be on a call with somebody or to get a text from them and be like, man, like I'm having a great day. Like this is really working. Like I'm so much more productive. And then having those moments where we kind of review for the past month and be like, look at where you were a month ago when you answered the, the questionnaire that I sent you about what your life was like then. And then look at how much more money you've made, how much more focused work you're doing all these different things. It is the most rewarding feeling. And, you know, some people ask me if I regret the path that my life's taken. Like if I regret not going to high school, if I regret putting six years into college to get a job that I left in less than three years. And honestly, no, because that path got me where I am today. The good and the bad got me to where I am today. The, what, what we have to do is make the best of what we're given in the current moment. And that sounds very cliche and guru -y, but really when it comes down to it, that's, that's all that we can, can do. And that's what I've, my mom's helped me out with, with that mindset a lot. So she's, my mom's my hero. But yeah, I mean, what I've tried to do over time is make the best with whatever situation resources and ideas that I had and you cut off there you said oh. do the best with the situations and res yeah situations and resources and you cut off okay 
Uh, yeah. So really what I've tried to do is do the best with the situations and resources and ideas that I've had. And it's gotten me to where I am today. So I never could have imagined at any point that I would be here, but I really like the way things are going today. You mentioned your mom's your hero and she's helped you with some mindset stuff. Mm -hmm. What, what has she helped you with? So my mom was the one responsible for getting World of Warcraft addicted Joey to actually make something of himself. So I started having, you know, inkling of the idea of, well, maybe I should go to college and get a degree and do something with my life. But I didn't believe in myself because I felt that if I was going to go to college, then I would be terrible socially because I had had no friends up until then, basically. And that I wouldn't know enough because I mainly read fiction books. And so my mom was the one who really pushed me to go do that because she knew that I could make better of myself. And so with that initial push, I finally started college and started making something of myself. And then the other aspect of it is that in 2018, uh, two weeks before I was going off to Nashville for my summer internship, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer and I lost my dad to, um, a lot of different cancers a few years, 12 years before that. And so that was really hard for me. Um, I have an extremely small, small family It's basically just me and my mom at this point. So, um, I, that, that was hard for me to take, but you know, I offered to stay back at home and take care of her but she told me no to go ahead up there so she got through that and i was constantly amazed at her strength and her resilience getting through that because she actually had just started a job at an oncology clinic taking care of cancer patients right wow so she got that job and then a few months later she got diagnosed with cancer herself so uh the benefit of that is that she was surrounded by incredible coworkers who took care of her. So I didn't have to worry so much about her, but that's just one example of how incredibly strong she is, which is pretty surprising. Like knowing the family that she comes from, you know, kind of a backwoods Kentucky family, you know, it's, it's weird how different she is from all those. So, you know, seeing how strong and calm she is, when it, when life throws weird stuff at her is just absolutely incredible. It's been very inspirational for me as I navigate my own life. Where do you think she finds that strength? I don't know. And I ask her that sometimes myself. I, I think that she has a different perspective on life. I'm not sure where it came from. You know, she initially her, marriage to my dad was was good but he had some mental disorders so when i was in my mid teens or early teens he his mental state started declining rapidly and so he became rather abusive to my mom and i but uh, that caused her to withdraw a good bit for a couple of years but it seemed like internally she was getting stronger from it and that's the thing, you know, the bad experiences can either mess us up or they can make us stronger or both. But, uh, yeah, she's incredibly strong. I can't honestly can't tell you for sure where it came from, but I'm very thankful to have her in my life. If it wasn't for her, I would maybe not even be alive anymore, honestly, but I definitely wouldn't be where I am. And I, if I was still around, I'd probably still be playing World of Warcraft. Dude, that is incredible that you've made it this far to tell the tale and overcome all that adversity you know, her and you uh, it's incredible and it's really cool to to see someone do it because you doing it and you talking about it leads someone right now in some difficult situation who it might be it might be tomorrow when we post this it might be 10 years from now who's listening to this it's mm -hmm. giving them hope and giving them a chance and saying, wow, if Joey did it, then maybe I can. So along those same lines, what would you tell that, that kid right now who is in an abusive relationship with their father or dealing with some real difficult 
real difficult stuff. What do you, what would you tell that person directly? The first thing I would say is I don't believe that I'm special. I know that there's a lot of survivorship bias associated with stories like mine where it's like, well, you know, of course you're talking about it and you're proud of it because you made it out. And then that could spin off into a debate about privilege and all that stuff, of course. But the first thing I would say is we all have the ability to change our environments and our lives and our situations. It may be immensely difficult and challenging. It may take a long time, but I would say, start thinking about how you would like things to change. So do a brain dump about it, you know, start journaling and start, you know, thinking about the way you want things to change, start thinking about what you want out of life for yourself and those you care about, and then find people who can help guide you. So one of the benefits of the social media age, and especially platforms like Twitter, is it's very easy to connect with people like us, right? You know, people who can talk about and like help guide people. So just start reaching out to people. People are social media world can be kind of cruel sometimes, but for the most part, people are more than willing to help you. So if you reach out to someone and say, Hey, like, this is my situation. I'm having a problem with this. You know, what, what do you, what would you say about this? You're going to find a lot of help from that. There are people who DM me uh, periodically on Twitter and, you know, tell me, they'll write me a couple paragraphs about what's going on in their lives. And they're like, Hey, like, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to dump all this all on you. I'm like, no, man, like, first off, I love helping. And, you know, here's some guidance. It's, you know, it's just that simple. So figure out what you want and then reach out for help getting what you want. Like I said, it may be hard. It may take time. You may not even really know what you want yet, but a little action, a little movement forward is better than nothing and continuing to sit and be unsatisfied with the life that you have. Where did you reach out for help, if at all, when you were in that situation? Me starting to read self-help books was really the, the first. So, you know, a way that you can look at reading a book like that is kind of a conversation with that person. It's a summation of a large part of their knowledge. So I turned to books. I read something like 75 books in, in 2018 and 2019 total. So, uh, really, really I turned to books and then I started talking to people like Dan co on Twitter and a few other people like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't have a podcast like this. that was telling me to do that kind of thing, you know? So it wasn't something I was doing exactly intentionally, but it's something where I was taking initiative and looking for things, looking for resources, books, articles, people that could help because I wanted to keep improving myself and improving others at that point with improvement geek slash cyberner. So yeah, I would, I would say another piece of advice to people is be aware of opportunities and things that could help you because there are a lot of, the more that you look, the more opportunities you find is what I've found. You mentioned books and you read 75 books in a year, which is yeah. incredible. Are there any that stick out or that you've reread and that you just keep coming back to time and time again? Atomic Habits by James Clear is by far my favorite. That's the one that really ignited me doing what I do today. But the one that the first self-help book that I read was Maximum Achievement by Brian Tracy. That was the one that kicked it off because I can't remember. And, you know, every time I talk about this, people ask me what it was and I need I can't remember. But there was something in that book, some, some it's probably a platitude now, if I look back on it, but there was something that was presented a certain way and it just blew my mind. Right. And it just gave me a completely new perspective on things. And then that led to me reading others. So that's one I definitely need to go back and reread. Let's see. Mindset by Carol Dweck is a good one. It talks about a fixed mindset versus the growth mindset and yeah, those are the big three for me. I love it, man. And I'll be putting those down below and ordering 
uh, maximum achievement right after this, because I'm, I'm very curious, you know, one thing that you've become known for on Twitter, at least is your daily walks. Yep. And I'm curious why you decided to start this habit. So like many things in my life, now that I look back on it, I kind of did it on a whim. I thought it sounded cool. So I wanted to start doing like a monthly series of things. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, I saw a couple of people who were doing, you know, walking videos and, and it was just like a one-off thing. And I was like, well, what if I did that for the entire month of July? So I started that and I started the psychology fact of the day series, which doesn't have a number attached to it. So people don't actually know that, but I started those on July 1st of 2020 and it was only intended to be for that month you know like the the initial series name was walking and talking every day in july or something clunky like that but the reception of it was so cool that i decided to keep it going permanently so now it's like you know people are like holy crap you've been doing this for like 300 days like today i did 344 so i'm coming up on day 365 on july 1st approximately and i think i'm going to do a walking live like live stream like live periscope event and just like answer some q do some q a's and stuff like that so yeah i mean that's been really cool to do and the another reason why i did it is i knew that it would help me with my speaking ability and help me be able to improvise and talk about something off the top of my head and answer questions on a podcast right but, you know, when I go to do a daily walk, I never know what I'm going to be talking about when I walk out the door. I don't know until I'm on the sidewalk walking, like on the, on the sidewalk outside of my apartment complex. Like I never know, like I pick the topic then. And I do that intentionally because I want to improvise. And it may take me a few tries to like get something that sounds decent, but I still like the impro- improvisational aspect of it. And all those reps count that you yep. didn't post that that's the great part about it. It's so interesting when looking at your story, because you took that habit of world of Warcraft mm-hmm. and maybe it was going in a negative direction and keeping you in the same place. But now you're taking those same skills. It seems like from the outside and applying it to your own growth and your own perspective. Is that true? And if so, how has world of Warcraft impacted your personal development? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I know that video games get a lot of hate in certain circles around Twitter and the self-development community, but I am incredibly thankful that I stumbled on World of Warcraft because if I didn't have that, I wouldn't really have any social skills when I started college. You know, I was playing WoW hard, obviously. So I was in a guild, a group of players, and we were grouping up and doing stuff a few nights a week. I had a lot of friends in the game. So you know, I got a lot of social skills through playing that game, but it also taught me stuff about, you know, current money, you know, um, going after things in a systemized way, you know, doing quests, getting gear, stuff like that. Taught me about cooperating with other people when doing raids and things along, along those lines. So yeah, I definitely have taken those skills that I learned from playing WoW and put them into school and systemizing that when I was in school. And then to a point in my career, but really with my business and creating, you know, task lists and stuff like that, and then applying resources, whether that's time or, or money, whether I'm buying like Gumroad courses or coaching for myself, things like that, you know, those skills have definitely translated. And again, like I regret letting myself go to the point that I was so addicted and so unhealthy, but I don't regret having that period of my life because it's made me stronger now. Mm. And you're going to be able to use, uh, and for the future, the thing about a negative habit or something that keeps you where you're at is like, you can only do it for so long and the negativity gets you to a certain place, but positive habits, there's no amount that will make you stop of people helping and, and great things achieved. It's like, when you're in that negative place, you can only go so far, but when you're in a positive place, it's expanding and it's nonstop and it's a beautiful place to operate from. Yeah, for sure. I've really noticed that compound interest lately. You know, I've 
had several people shout me out on Twitter lately, which is uh, it's been really cool. It makes me feel like I'm bragging just to talk about it, but it's been really nice to see that impact that I'm having on the community that we have here. And it's just, it, it really motivates me to work even harder and have more of an impact on people. You know, like I said, I want to leave a positive legacy wherever I am. And I want to make everybody around me stronger and better. Yeah, man. And you're not bragging at all. And something that I, I keep hearing that you're doing is you're downplaying your own achievements, man. Yeah. And, and the thing is, you should be proud of that. And you've worked and you've done what you've done. So there's no reason to downplay what your accomplishments are. You should be proud of that, man. And I'm so proud of you. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I'm definitely proud. But I, I, for some reason, like ever since I was a kid, I've had this thing where I, I don't, I don't like bragging. Like, I don't even feel like I'm getting close to bragging. And so that's been challenging for me when I tell my full story, like going from like my childhood through college to World of Warcraft to software engineering, Georgia Tech, which is a relatively good school. See, I even downplay Georgia Tech. Um, <laughs> it's like a top five engineering school in the U.S. And there then going you go, to, man. Um, you know, it's Improvement Geek and Cypreneur, you know, like every time I tell that story, the better that it gets, the more I feel like I'm bragging, but the, I need to tell that story because it can inspire people. Right. And that's exactly why I share it. If it wasn't for that aspect of it, I'd never talk about it, but I feel a responsibility now to share that story every now and then, because I want to inspire those people. Like if I came from that situation and I turned into what I'm doing now and whatever I'll be doing a year, five years from now, how many other teenagers are there out there? How many other young adults out there who are in a similar situation who need to hear a story like that, that can show them, Hey, it may take you a while, but you can pull yourself together and then they will help others with their story. Why are you worried about appearing like you're bragging? I don't know. I really don't. I, it's, it probably has something to do with the way I grew up. I honestly don't know. It's a good question. Something that I probably should investigate a bit more. I, I'm a very extroverted person. I love being around people. Like I, I love being at conventions and stuff like that and being around a lot of people, but I'm also simultaneously a pretty reserved person. So I'm pretty chill. You know, I don't say a whole lot. I'm not like a really hype dude. So that could be part of it where it's just like, I don't really, it could also be like, I don't really feel a need to talk about my successes. Like I don't need that validation, you know, and mm. that can be kind of difficult. Like I don't, I don't brag about, you know, like Gumroad screenshots or Stripe invoices or whatever on Twitter because like, I don't need that validation from that. Like I passed 30,000 followers on Twitter last week or if just a few days ago, actually. Congratulations. And thank you. I thought about posting about it, but it's like, why? Like, I don't, you know, like, what's the point? So I'm trying to figure out what I need to do is find the happy medium. But, and the happy medium is more so like sharing these wins in a way where it's like, hey, I did this thing. Here's how I did it. Here's how you can do it. And that way I won't feel like I'm just bragging. Hmm. Yeah, I think it comes down to confidence in... Yeah your accomplishments and what your intent is when you're sharing, right? If your intent is to be like, look how good I am. That's one thing that stems from insecurity. But right. if your intent is just like, I want to inspire people and this is what I've done and I'm proud of what I've done. Like then it's like, it's freeing in a sense. And it's just confidence. And it's just um, something that I think you should be doing more and more of and being proud of your accomplishments and not wanting to downplay them because they're real and they can inspire people and the intent is pure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's definitely something I'll think over this weekend. Yeah, man. So I want to finally get to, you know, you've worked with so many top performers and yeah. I want to I wanna talk about the biggest things you've learned from that experience. So one of the biggest things I've learned is humans are all the same in a lot of ways, and they're also quite different in a lot of ways. So what I mean by that is 
from a psychological and neurological foundation, you know, there are certain things that we have in us off the top of my head, like our psychological defense mechanisms, right? The fight, flight, freeze mechanisms. Like a lot of that stuff is shared amongst everybody, but then you have people or people want to do things at a certain pace. People learn different ways. People have different skills. And so it's been interesting for me to work with so many different people and design my program so that it starts with, you know, fundamentals first and then gets highly personalized, right? And then be reactive to what the person needs from there. And what that's had me thinking about a lot lately is I feel like that's a drawback of productizing stuff like this. You know, people have been saying like, hey, man, you should make a course. It's like, yeah, I will over the summer, probably like late summer, probably. But the problem with, you know, courses and books is they're usually designed for the masses, right? So it's designed for mass appeal for as many people as possible. And so they're not going to be a great fit for most people, right? So like, if you go, if you go read the reviews of Atomic Habits or something, you're going to find people who hate that book, even though it's objectively an incredibly, incredible book, subjectively, it's not going to be all that for some people, right? So my point is, you know, with a product like a book or a course, you're not going to serve like every single person, an individual person, 100%, right? Because it's not going to be personalized. They may think I already know all this crap. Why am I wasting my time with this? Or they may think this is too much information. I'm overwhelmed. I've seen people complain for books. I've seen people complain about like this book's too technical. Whereas I love technical books because I'm a nerd like that, you know? So my point is to answer your question, it's been very interesting to learn more about the individual differences between people. And then after I get off a call with somebody, reflect on that, you know, review my notes for my conversation and think about, okay, how can I help them better moving forward and adjust from that? That's, that's been an incredible experience. I've absolutely loved pretty much everybody that I've worked with so far. You mentioned the fundamentals in that yeah. piece. What are the fundamentals that you want to focus on for everyone? The very first thing that we work on is always sleep. And there's li- literally only been one, maybe two people who didn't need help with sleep. People intend to sleep more, but they're just not doing it. So we start with sleep because sleep is really the core of our daily schedule. And so we start there and we say, okay, okay, you need to be sleeping like seven and a half, eight hours a day, right? And so we have these hours on your schedule. Okay, cool. Then what we do is we have an evening routine that I call dark mode. So my clients listening to this will perk up at dark mode maybe or get sad Um, because I text them and remind them of dark mode for the first couple of weeks and it's not always fun. (laughs) Then the other thing is we have a morning routine. So what you have is like, you know, eight hours of your day, you should be trying to sleep. And then you have these other routines that take up 30 to 60 minutes. So that's nine hours of your day is already planned out. So we start with that. And then we start looking at, okay, well, what to do with the other hours of the day. And it's like, I know you have this big chaotic mess of to do's. Okay, well, let's start organizing that and structuring that let's start putting time on your calendar dedicated to certain things. So that that way, you can then get out of bed in the morning and have a pretty good plan of what you're going to be working on for the day. And you're going to feel good enough to actually do it. Those are the two keys because you can use whatever productivity system that works for you. But if you don't feel like doing it, you're still not really going to do a whole lot. So that's why my approach is to productivity and performance is also involving mental performance and physical performance. Cause you know, I, we've all been there where it's like, we may feel be in good shape physically. We may be energetic, but our mind's not right that day or re- the reverse where it's like, you know, mentally, I know what I need to do, but you know, especially when I was really overweight, I was so tired, you know, that, that physical tiredness and fatigue messes you up mentally as well. So that's why we have to take the approach of like starting to get the mind and the body better. And then that leads into really fine tuning things to the individual. What is dark mode? Dark mode is shutting off your screens about 30 minutes before you go to bed. So 
I'm sure basically everybody knows this, but the blue light from screens stops the production of melatonin, the hormone that makes you sleepy. So what a lot of people do, even though they know this, is they will, you know, shut off their TV or their, their laptop and maybe brush their teeth, hopefully, and then go right to bed. And then they're laying in bed and they're like, man, why can't I sleep? This is so weird. What's wrong with me? Well, it's because your brain wasn't generating that melatonin, but you're, you were also keeping your brain busy for that time. Right? So it's like, if you've ran a 5k or you've gone for a jog and you like cross the finish line or you get back home, you're not really going to be having like a normal conversation for a minute. Like you're going to be sweaty and gross and out of breath and your heart rate is going to be up. And it's, there's a similar parallel to mental state, mental performance as well, where if you're, you know, having, if like, we're having this great conversation right now, and I'm not going to be able to just take a nap immediately after, right? Like I would need to like chill for a bit because it's like when you have a lot of intellectual stimulation, then you need some time to kind of wind down. So what dark mode is, is that period of shut off your screens and do stuff that isn't very stimulating mentally or physically. And so what that does is it lets your brain produce that melatonin so you get sleepy. And it also lets your brain wind down so you can actually get to sleep. Yeah, I've personally found that for me personally, it takes two hours for me to go from consuming content or creating content and looking at blue light to yeah. then being able to fall asleep. So what do you recommend that your clients do in that 30 minute or two hour period? It's all about things that aren't very stimulating. So a list of things that you can do are brain dumping, meditation. I recommend if you're going to do those at night, kick, kick off dark mode with those. Then you can do meal prep. You can clean up around your place. You can read books, but specifically fiction or biographies are good. Biographies are good because you, know, you can learn from other people's experiences and they're generally told in like a narrative way. So their stories. I wouldn't read things like atomic habits or, you know, a psychology textbook when you're trying, when you're in dark mode, cause that's just going to keep your brain wound up. Uh, and then another great thing to do is taking a hot shower or a hot bath. And that's something that I highly recommend because what that does is due to homeostasis, it drops your internal body temperature. It actually lowers it. And when your internal body temperature lowers, you usually start getting sleepier. And it'll also relax your muscles and everything. So you won't feel as physically tense. Mental stress can cause physical stress and vice versa. So you do that and then you'll have an easier time falling asleep. And then the other thing that I want to mention is if you can't sleep or you wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep, same rules apply. Don't reach for your phone because your nervous system actually becomes more sensitive to light the later and later it gets. I learned that from Andrew Huberman and his podcast. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and you check your phone, you're basically wrecking your sleep right there. Like you're gonna have a really hard time getting back to sleep. I've learned that the hard way so many times where I would do that. And it's like, okay, well, I woke up at 4am and never got back to sleep. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It happens to the best of us. But what is the feeling like when you get a text from someone that says, wow, like what you've done has transformed my life. Talk us about the real meat of your joy when yeah. it comes to, to people. Fulfillment. Honestly, like it's fulfillment and this sounds kind of sad, but like I, fulfillment is not something that I've really had much prior to doing this throughout my life because you know world of warcraft is like a hamster wheel so you're always like chasing the next thing the next whatever and then with college that was you know checking boxes so i could get my degree and then my job wasn't very fulfilling so the big thing is fulfillment and feeling like this is this is my thing you know like i've i've helped someone improve themselves and that's a big part of it. I mean, there, there was a, a client of mine who just got a new job, got like just finished up an interview an hour before we started talking today. And they gave him the job offer like immediately after his last interview, when he talked to the CEO of the company. And I was just like, sent him some texts and I was like, abs I, I, I was blown away by that. You know, like it's, it's just an unreal feeling 
hearing that kind of thing. It, it like nothing makes me happier. Dude, you're you're changing the world one person at a time, and the world is better off with you in it and you spreading the message of pursuing the highest version of yourself. So thank you for being you. Thank you for this incredible conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? Any topics you'd like to explore before we actually go to a close? Yeah, definitely. So there is one thing and that relates to what we talked about a little bit ago. So what I usually wind up closing with is something called the locus of control. So the locus of control is a psychological concept that refers to your belief about how much you can control your environment and your life and everything else, your experience. If you have an external locus, then you believe that you are the passenger of life, that everything just happens to you and it's all external factors. Like everything is, it's, everything's someone else's fault. If you have an internal locus, you're the driver. You can look back at the things happening in your life and you believe that you are the one that was responsible for them and that you can control things going forward. It's important for us as humans to have as much of an internal locus of control as possible. It's important for us, no matter how powerless we may feel, it is so critical for us to realize and become aware of the power that we have. It may not seem like we have a lot of power, but it's important for us to acknowledge that power and then start taking control. And that's what I slowly learned how to do over time. That's what I try to get my my followers and my clients and everybody to do the challenging thing though is that with control comes responsibility and that can be painful so if you have things that you look back and you see oh man that was my fault that can hurt but the thing is is that i mean the, the two are linked you know you can't separate the two you can't have control without responsibility but Try to find the excitement in that and realize, okay, I was responsible for this negative event, but I can also be responsible for a positive event. Yes, I may have let myself go and ate a bunch and play World of Warcraft and gained 100 pounds, uh, especially relevant over the pandemic lockdowns, but I was responsible for that. I can be responsible for me losing 100 pounds, for me starting a social media account, starting to create content to help other people. <clears throat> and better my life and help other people better their lives. That's the key. Start with the awareness. Think about that. I challenge everybody to reflect on that. And then think about how you can take control of your life going forward, one little piece at a time, but start getting better each day. I absolutely love it. Thank you, Joey, for this great conversation. Where can people find more from you? Best place to find me is twitter.com slash cypreneur. And I'm not good at spelling things off the top of my head, <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be in a link. Hopefully be in a link somewhere below. Yep. So links Twitter, below. Twitter is the best place and I will be making a website soon, but uh, that'll be a future project. And uh, yeah, come find me on Twitter. DM me if you have any questions, comments. Um, yeah, I love talking to people, so. Awesome. And he's a great follow. Everyone check him out. And thank you, Joey. Really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you, man. I look forward to next time.